Welcome to Insider Events. Talent acquisition strategy is your small business secret superpower. In partnership with Indeed, here's our host, Senior Editor of Entrepreneurship and Careers at Insider, Emily Canal. Hi, I'm Emily Canal, Senior Editor of Entrepreneurship and Careers at Insider. Thank you for joining. We are in an extremely unique moment for entrepreneurship in the U.S. In the last two years, we've seen a record-breaking number of people start their own businesses. Some people launch ventures in the hopes of earning extra money on the side of their nine to five gig, while others quit long-time careers for the chance to be their own boss or found entrepreneurship after pandemic-induced job losses. But an entrepreneurial boom gave way to the great resignation and many small business owners struggled to hire vital talent in order to scale their startups. That's still the case today, but the stakes keep getting higher. With economic indicators pointing toward a likely recession, entrepreneurs need to retain their top talent while still recruiting the people who will elevate their businesses. But they're facing stiff competition from behemoth companies that can afford to offer hefty signing bonuses and lucrative perks. So where does that leave small business owners, dubbed the backbone of America's economy? We would love for our audience to join the conversation on social media by using the hashtag insider events. You can also submit questions for our panelists through the dashboard at the bottom of the screen. You will also see an icon for our survey that you can take at any time during or after the event. We want your feedback. And now to talk about how small business owners can hire and retain talent in today's challenging labor market. I'm joined by Judy Nam, the Vice President of Small Business Marketing at Indeed, Bernard Coleman III, the Chief Diversity and Engagement Officer at the small business payroll platform Gusto, and Rhonda Murray, the Founder and President of DEI training and consulting firm Elevated Diversity. Judy, what do you think is the state of entrepreneurship right now? How are business owners feeling after a tumultuous two years? motivated to keep chugging along despite the ever-changing challenges they face? Or are they starting to lose their motivation? Thanks for that, and so great to be here. Um, we talk to entrepreneurs all the time, and entrepreneurship is never easy. But what we do know about entrepreneurs is they are highly adaptive and resilient. And so what we found, despite the fact that the last two years have been just causing upside down and sideways motions in all cases, our entrepreneurs are still weathering the storm. And for those who've actually been able to start a business during the last two years, all of those folks are finding ways to adapt and adjust into this new world that we're in today. And in recent surveys, we've actually been able to check in with entrepreneurs and just try to understand what those top challenges are for them today. And they're actually not very different. You know, they are still thinking about employees, retention, hiring, keeping them happy. Um, finances, you know, the cost of running a business and some of the new challenges like supply chain, inflation, taxes, et cetera, as well as just their core business, right? Selling to their customers, making the, making sure that they are fulfilling the sales that they have and just trying to make sure that they keep their businesses afloat. All those challenges are the same as, you know, entrepreneurship challenges before the pandemic, but just kind of in this new world that I think everybody is still somewhat adapting to. But the motivation is still very high. Bernard, what is your sense of the mood among entrepreneurs right now? Is it something similar to what Judy described? Yeah, it's, it's very similar. I think there's, uh, along with that, there's competition for talent. I think talented people always have options. So I think entrepreneurs are trying to attract that talent. I also think it's keeping costs down, obviously. Are we heading to a recession? Are we in a recession? Who knows? They're really trying to keep costs contain, contained so that way you can focus on your core business or grow your business. So I think that's always a struggle or, and challenge that uh, entrepreneurs face. I think how you can add value continually, I think that's always the unique uh, trick that you need to have down as an entrepreneur is how are you adding value? What problem are you solving? What problem are, uh, what answer are you addressing and delivering for your customers, right? And then I think finally it's, again, managing the uncertainty. Rhonda, what are you seeing among small business owners today? Any of that uncertainty that Bernard just described? I, I think it's, um, we have an interesting vantage point um, in that we work with large organizations and we also work with small business owners. Um, and, and what we're seeing from small businesses is they're looking for ways 
to make their organizations incredibly attractive. So they're looking for some of these DEI strategies that could help them um, really leverage their organization and begin to attract new, new talent. Bernard, what is your sense of the mood among entrepreneurs right now? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there's a lot of issues going on. Um, I think they're probably thinking about competition for talent. I always say talented people always have options. So there's always a war for talent. I also think dealing with inflation. Inflation is very real. Uh, what does that mean for the market? What does that mean for a small business owner? I also think uh, thinking about keeping those costs down, right? Obviously, you want to have enough ramp to run your business and run your business well. Uh, if inflation is eating away at it, I think it does impact an entrepreneur's ability to, to grow their business. And I think continually adding value. And what I mean by that is uh, there's usually a problem you're, you set out to solve. Can you continually add value so that way your business can grow? And I think finally is managing the uncertainty. It's a lot going on with the economy. Are we in a recession? Are we nearing a recession? It feels like a lot of whiplash and limbo. So I think small businesses, entrepreneurs are really grappling with that and trying to figure out which way is up and making those adjustments on the fly. Rhonda, are you seeing something similar among small business owners today? Yeah, I, I definitely am seeing something similar to what um, Bernard is, is describing. One thing that um, I, I think we need to be mindful of is that entrepreneur, that small business owner, they're inherently optimistic. Um, so this is a group of folks that feel like, okay, I can do this better. I can develop this brand. I have a, a better way to um, solve this issue. That's why they're they're in business. So I think inherently they're optimistic because it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge for them to find the talent. It's a challenge um, to find ways to still grow the business, even though there is a, a higher level of uncertainty. Um, but in terms of the small businesses that we work with. Um, they're, they're looking for ways to enhance or up-level um, their recruiting practices. So I, I see it as an opportunity, as, as I do with uh, many of our, our business owners that we work with. When we talk about small business owners, who do you imagine, Bernard? Who are the types of people who gravitate toward this field? And how many people typically work for their business? Yeah, I think it varies, but I think uh, I think to have an entrepreneurial spirit, you're a risk taker to a degree, right? Um, you're a problem solver. You want to be able to solve the problems that you see you're facing and develop solutions for that. And I think typically small businesses are on the, on the smaller side. I think it's less than 25 employees. And that's when you first starting out, you might have uh, your core group of people with the, with the intention to grow your business. But I think initially folks start off pretty small, less than 25 people. Um, with that, uh, I think, I'm not going to say that with the hustler spirit, I'll say with the entrepreneurial spirit to like really hustle and figure out which ways can I do this to grow my business really well. Rhonda, I'd love to hear from you. Who do you imagine when you think about small business owners and about how many people work for them? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, we hear over and over again, small businesses being the backbone of the, the country um, to Bernard's Point, they are typically very small, whether it's a, um, a, a very a micro business, as it's, it's called in some cases. Um, but I would say millions of individuals work for a small business within the country. And what about characteristics that you see among them? Well, the characteristics um, are incredibly impressive, right? So we think of an entrepreneur or a small business person as someone who um, has that, that confidence and feels like, okay, there is a better way of doing this. Many come from a corporate environment and within those environments, they often feel stifled. They feel like I've got a better solution. Um, so that's when, when we see those individuals strike out on their own. Um, and that's why I think we've seen such an increase uh, with the, the pandemic, with individuals feeling like, hey, there's got to be a better way. Um, and they decide to strike out on their own. So it sounds like we're hearing a lot of the similar qualities, both creativity, problem solving. Um, Judy, what do you think about the types of people who are attracted to entrepreneurship and typically 
how large are their businesses in terms of employees? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way to think about the the kind of classic definition of a small business owner or an SMB being around that like 500 employees or less type of model. But I mean, businesses from one person to 500 are so diverse, right? And the, the types of people that, that work there, run those types of businesses are so diverse. And which is why I think the small business community is really amazing. And that's where their creativity and sort of their, their problem solving is, is really interesting. And so I, you know, I have plenty of friends who are small business owners and I'm always just in awe of their resilience, their energy and their commitment, not just to their core business and their customers, but also to their employees. Um, but that, that gives you a little bit of sense of kind of how I think about our, our small business audience. We've seen a massive entrepreneurial boom in the last two years, with more than 10 million new businesses launched since 2020. Judy, are many of these people looking to scale the businesses they recently created by hiring? Absolutely. Um, just as of July, Indeed you know, was looking at how much our business has grown and just sort of how many jobs have been posted on Indeed. And we saw a 54% increase in the number of jobs posted on Indeed based on, um, compared to the, the previous uh, pre-pandemic years. And so that is massive growth and a really strong indication that people are not only um, starting businesses, but also continuing to invest in growing their businesses, despite the fact that, you know, the last few years have been pretty rough. Bernard, are you also seeing that growth among the small business owners that you work and talk with? Yeah, we certainly are. We're seeing a lot of uh, small businesses grow. I do think, to uh, the point made previously, the pandemic created a lot of problems. Uh, I think a lot of folks focus on what could be the solution here. And we saw a lot of uh, businesses born out of the pandemic, and we've seen them thrive since then. And I think a lot of people did strike out to figure out how they could go about um, doing things better, um, improving upon processes, but also just following their passions. I've seen a lot of folks um, have a pandemic realization where they realize that, you know, this is my life's work, I'm going to go pursue it. So it almost uh, bred a, this new spirit that wasn't there before and thus created their business. So I've seen a lot of different ways that businesses have come to be formed and a lot of different motivations, but I think ultimately it's to solve a problem. Uh, uh, something you had seen island for a while and you want to address it. So I've seen a lot of uh, business growth in that sense. Uh, and I think it's, it's really great for the country. Rhonda, that, that realization that Bernard just mentioned. So have you seen a lot of business owners go from that to then wanting to scale up by hiring employees to you know, really expand their business and grow it into a different level? Yeah, again, I, I think in terms of that small business owner, they are inherently positive people. They're very driven people. So when you have that type of um, profile, those individuals want to, to succeed, and typically they want to succeed in a very big way. Um, so realizing that, again, coming from a, a corporate background, maybe they saw things that um, they thought they could do better with, whether it's how they recruit or how they um, engage their employees or their benefits or what have you. So they felt like, okay, I've got, I've got a better way of getting this done. So I, I do think those individuals that go into um, the starting a business, that they are really looking to, to grow that business and, and scale it. So we know business owners want to scale their businesses by hiring people, but so many are facing challenges when trying to recruit and retain talent given today's competitive labor market. For example, Business owners need to be competitive in terms of the well-being they offer employees and making them feel included in the workplace. Rhonda, how can entrepreneurs make themselves more appealing to job seekers through components like DEI and benefits? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that, that we should be mindful of, though, is that um, some people simply prefer working for a small business. There's so many benefits and so many offerings or attributes um, that a small business can offer that a larger organization simply can't compete with. Um, so I, I think that's one thing that we need to, to recognize. I always liken it to 
um, selecting a college. I just dropped off my, my youngest to UCLA last week. Um, but when she was looking for um, a school, she knew that she wanted a large organization. She wanted some of those um, things that go along with attending a large school. However, there's others. My, my oldest decided to go to Georgetown, which is a very small school. So I think it just really depends on what that individual is looking for. With the point being, I, I think small business owners should really um, not lean into some of the offerings. Um, and in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I mean, I think that's a perfect place for small businesses to really hone in on some of the things that they can offer that or other organizations simply can't offer. Judy, through your work with Indeed, are you seeing small business owners take a different approach when posting job openings that highlight benefits or DEI within their workplaces? Absolutely. Um, we do a lot of research around workplace well-being. And one of the things that we've found is things like pay and flexibility of hours and benefits are table stakes these days. And that's great. But that's not really what inspires workers and employees to be really um, inspired by the work that they're doing. And what we've found in our research is that things like energy around the tasks that you are doing, a sense of belonging, being able to trust your employee, uh, employer and the fellow employees are actually a lot more important when it comes to workplace well-being. And so what we've done at Indeed is enabled um, employers to actually be able to, to showcase that um, within their job postings. And so we do things that encourage um, our employers to go ahead and, and advocate for particular um, benefits that they have or different values. And we often talk about things like employer branding being really important so that um, from the first moment that a potential job candidate looks at your job description, they get a really good sense of what your business is all about, not just the, the job you want them to do. And so we encourage throughout our platform different ways for a business owner to really let their business shine and, and really articulate what makes them different. And so yes, we absolutely see it happening. It's definitely a trend and workplace well-being is something that's super important now for job seekers and it's actually becoming more so. I think our, our, in, our data indicates that with younger generations, that that feeling of, of workplace well-being is almost like a right, not a really a privilege. And so we're trying to help and assist um, employers on, on sort of navigating that cultural change. Can I, can I jump in there too? Because I, I think that's absolutely um, what we're saying with our, our work and, and where we help our, our clients again lean into some of those the changing dynamics within the, the workplace. Um, there's several studies out there that are supporting the fact that job seekers are looking for diverse organizations. That, that's an important thing with numbers as high as 76% saying that an organization's commitment to diversity is of great importance to, to them. So I think that that says a lot about um, the millennials and how we're seeing, definitely seeing a shift in, in what they're looking for in terms of job satisfaction. Um, and then again, how can a small business owner really leverage that and be strategic in how they, they position their organizations and their job opportunities? So it sounds like it's this balance of feeling like a sense of belonging. Um, whether that's aligning with the company's mission or just feeling that you belong at a particular small business. Bernard, how are small business owners articulating that sense of belonging now to job seekers? How do you make them feel welcome when you're talking to anyone that could be on the internet looking at your job posting? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it comes down to Really, what's your employee value proposition? What is it that you're putting out in the world? What is your calling card? What are you known for? Because I think it has to one uh, be consistent internally and externally, because I think folks are looking for that alignment. I think people are looking for purpose. I do think people are looking for values. They're looking for belonging. And I think you have to be able to convey that not only in on your website, right? But in your hiring process and, and people you talk to, the word of mouth, it has to be consistent because people are, uh, a little bit more discerning than they perhaps used to be. They really are looking for that alignment. 
And I think you have to really make your employee value proposition true. I think a big part of that is really thinking about the entire employee journey and how you can speak to all the different parts, like how you were hired, how you onboard people, how you develop them, the growth potential there. But I think when you could tell that fuller story, uh, people really value it. Uh, there's a, a, a study I like to always read. It's called the Edelman Public Trust Trust Barometer, and it says that people trust more in their companies than they do in the government. I think that's fascinating. I think that there is a almost a duty or an honor that employers have that they can really capitalize if they can demonstrate, like, you can trust me, you can come work here, you can thrive, you can um, have the best career of your life working at our X, Y, or Z company. And I think that's a powerful statement. I think you have to be able to draw that distinction because it is a market differentiator. And I think that's how you get great talent and keep great talent and, and thus grow your business. I think it needs to be consistent. It also needs to be authentic. Um, and I think Bernard... Bernard uh, alluded to that, but that's definitely one of the areas with our clients that, you know, it goes far beyond making sure that you've got representation on the images on your website. It goes far beyond having a, a beautifully worded um, DEI commitment statement on, on the website. Once those individuals actually come to your organization, they are expecting to see that commitment live and in action. Um, so it's really important to to start that mission, but make sure that it funnels through throughout the entire organization. So that image that that image you're portraying to job seekers seems just as important as the things you might be offering them when they get hired, like a 401k. Um, Bernard, what's another way that entrepreneurs can ensure their employees, both current and prospective, feel a sense of work-life balance and well-being. Yeah, I think I, I call it the CSA problem. You can't be inconsistent. Rhonda brought that up. Like a lot of folks will present something beautifully stated, wonderful images, and then they've basically mismanaged those expectations. I get to the company and it's, it's very much 180 degrees difference of, of what I thought I was going to be doing. And I think that's really important to get that down is to be consistent, to be authentic to show those values. I do think that's a, it's a strong pull. Um, and then that balance, I think people need to not only say the right things, but then actually have the actions and say that's true. If I tell you we have work-life balance here, you can't nod and say, yes, we do, and then ask somebody to work um, outside of what they thought was reasonable. So you have to kind of meet in the middle and really understand what folks are desiring and then what you can actually back up. I think that's really, really important. I think in the world for talent is really being authentically true to those values and living them, being them, and seeing them through those actions. I think if not, uh, you will have an attrition problem uh, very fast because they feel it's incongruent. So I think that's one of the most important things that I've been seeing is, is really kind of speaking that and managing those expectations. Because I think if you treat people as an adult, as a peer, uh, they appreciate that. Whether it's we're going to be picking up widgets or we're going to be doing X, Y, or Z, they appreciate the acknowledgement, the honesty, right, the authenticity about what what we're mission, what our mission is, how it ties back to our value, values, how it ties back to our customers. And that way, I think people can be more engaged when, you, when you're an honest broker in that in that engagement. Can I can I add something there too? Because I, I think that's a, a really good point to make. Years ago, when diversity, equity, and inclusion really started to take center stage, organizations would develop their DEI strategy. And it was always kind of off to the side. It wasn't anything that was truly woven into the very fabric of their organization. But today, what we recommend with our clients is that that DEI commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion really needs to be part of their overarching um, core values and mission statements. So we're seeing a lot of organizations weaving those that commitment, that very commitment into their overarching um, objectives. And, and it's resonating a lot more with, with employees because they see it as from a very much of a holistic perspective, not as, okay, that we're doing this um, so we can check a box. Um, so I, th I think that's an important thing for small business owners in particular to, to give some consideration to. Judy, how can small business owners be authentic, which we're hearing is, is vital to the hiring process, 
while also being realistic about what an employee might face when they are working for a small business. You know, some of these businesses are hustling, they're in lean mode. How do you balance those two components? I think it's all about transparency and also listening and a commitment to keep um, a close relationship with those employees, right? I think the changing landscape of work, business, it's constantly fluctuating and it's really hard to ask employees for just a, a blind commitment, let's say. And so I think the key to that is being honest and open and transparent as much as you can with employees listening to them and also taking, you know, their suggestions and feedback. What we found is that that ingestion of those ideas and the feedback and listening actually helps employees also buy into a lot of any like new changes, policies, directions of the company. And that's ultimately what you're looking for. You really want your employees to be committed to the business just as much as small business owners are, are often, you know, they often refer to their businesses as their, their, their other child, let's say. You know, it's hard to get that level of commitment if you're not part of the process. And so we've seen that ability for um, business owners to be really genuine and authentic and balance out the realities of life by listening and being very transparent feedback. But is that is that something that you can again lean into? So with that transparency, could it be positioned in a very positive light? Because I, I think one of the, the benefits of working for a, a smaller organization is that you get to be part of it. You know, you're not working in, in a silo or a smaller team. You're seeing that organization the successes, the losses, you're seeing the entire um, organization from a very comprehensive uh, perspective. And a lot of employees, I think, would be attracted to that. So I, I think it's something that small, again, small business, business owners, I own a small business. I have some of those same struggles and challenges, but I look to, for people that say, yeah, I'm up to that challenge. That to me is exciting that I'm part of something um, that we're, we're working together as a team and, and growing. Rhonda, we're talking a lot about transparency right now. How can an entrepreneur craft their hiring and recruiting strategy to find the right talent for their business by tapping that transparency that almost everyone wants to see right now? Yeah, I, I think there are several ways that, that it could be done. Um, starting with those job listings, you know, how are you crafting? What's the language that's being used in those job listings to get people engaged in the first place? And I, I think for small business owners, it's really about how are we marketing our brand to these employees that we want to to join their team. So I I, I think it's a function where you're um, as a small business owner, you're really spending time with those individuals, whether it's the hiring manager or yourself, um, spending time figuring out what's that story? How are we going to positively present our company and share with how we operate, that we do come from a place of, of high transparency and that we are looking to be very authentic in, in how we work and engage with each other. So I, I do think there's there's several ways that that could be approached. And just like everything else in business, it takes a, a strategy. You know, it's something that we that you really need to give some thought to, figure out what the best strategy is, and then then implement. Bernard, how do you see transparency working its way into talent recruitment, whether that's from a DEI perspective? being clear about the time commitments an employee might face or even benefits or a sense of belonging in the office? Yeah, I think from a transparent standpoint, you should tell people what it really is. I, I like to say, Augusto, let's engage in some real talk, respectfully, right? Let people know what's really going on. I think I didn't think people appreciate the intention that they are allowed to judge what they think the situation is before joining a team or joining a company. And I think that extends the hand of trust that way you can trust in the leader, uh, trust an entrepreneur, trust in the team that that's they're, they're, they're honest brokers. So I think that's that's very good to do. I think the other parts that I think are important are commuting what, what's, what's the day in the life, uh, communicating that to folks. So that way I'm authentically and transparently telling you what your day could be like, what your year could be like, what the team is like. But by sharing that without prompting, uh, I think that speaks to culture. 
That speaks to intentionality. And I think that speaks to values of what you can experience if you come and work at our company. Uh, I think if you are an entrepreneur and your company's big enough, you know, creating uh, communities. Uh, Rhonda talked about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. If you can create those community groups uh, that show that we have communities within communities at our company that you can join, that you can be part of, that you can develop your career, that you can uh, create more connection. Uh, I think connection's critically important, particularly nowadays where a company might be remote. I might never see you in real life. So I think being able to transparently show that, that day in the life, means a lot for uh, retention, but also for, for bringing folks in, because I think that word of mouth matters. I might go on Indeed and say, uh, look, you should check this place out. I'm having a great experience. You should come work with me. Uh, you know, we say that at Gusto, like, you know, a lot of it's referrals that come in through our company just because of word of mouth and that positive environment. So I think when you can transparently do that, that's it's free um, recruitment, you know, where people just automatically want to come work for you as opposed to uh, you having to put deep recruitment dollars and putting things on lots of different sites. Word of mouth goes a long way. So if I think if you can convey that, uh, you're winning the day. Judy, have you seen many entrepreneurs outline what a day in the life would look like on the job in their job posts? We definitely see it on job posts, but we also see it a lot on people's websites. And I think that's where a lot of that, what's it like to work here tends to come to life. So the ability to add photos and videos to really show, not just tell, what it's like, it's been really powerful. And so we've seen um, employers add some snippets of that into job descriptions. But I think what we've really found is bringing that story to life through all the various touch points that a business owner has at their disposal. So websites, job descriptions, their presence on social media, those are all opportunities for businesses to really showcase what it's like to, to be a part of that team. There's an entirely different side to this conversation which is the workplace trends we're seeing among job seekers right now. An entrepreneur may have the best policies in place, but they're facing employees who are quiet quitting, which can affect retention. Bernard, how can founders combat quiet quitting among their staff? I think it's really, we, we talked earlier, I think, um, I think Judy and Rhonda both brought up like the buy-in piece, right? Like transparently sharing, authentically sharing. I think by doing that, we are together on this. You have your opinion matters. I think incorporating people's ideas helps them be more bought in and they feel heard. I think a lot of times people feel talked down to or talked to and they don't feel like it's collaborative or, or community. Uh, I think the great thing about being a small business owner, uh, being an entrepreneur, you're small enough where you can actually not have so much distance between you and your team. And you can really make those adjustments on the fly so people are bought in and they won't necessarily quiet quit. You're not asking too much of them because you're helping right size the balance for your teams. For your business. Uh, and I think people, again, feel that more community and connection since so they're more inclined to, I think, have a, a different mindset as opposed to, I think the way I look at quiet quitting is if you distracted so much from me, I'm going to quote slowly move away from doing this work. But I think when I'm more bought in, when I see my ideas coming to life, uh, when you ask me my opinion, I feel more part of the company. So therefore, I, I maybe put a greater effort in just because it's my company too. Uh, so I think it's really helping understand the mindset of what, what talent's facing. You know, we've been in a pandemic for, for some time now. It's, it's been taxing on many folks, but I think when you make it more of a conversation as, as, a more, as opposed to a dictation, you know, it's not binary. Um, but letting people know what you can do and what you can't do, I think that goes a long way in terms of establishing that trust, using that buy-in to then motivate your employees to, to go uh, the long term and stay with the company and grow with the company. Rhonda, how should founders start having those conversations with employees almost, you know, ahead of seeing them quiet quit? How can they start this process now to avoid any of that down the line? Absolutely. And, and that's exactly what I was thinking as um, that question was being explored, because it we really want to um, avoid getting to that point to where someone feels like quiet quitting is, is um, appropriate. I, I think one of the greatest things about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that it is truly rooted in bringing people together and communicating and a sense of inclusion. So when someone feels included, someone feels like their voice counts and will be heard, I think they're much more inclined to share if there is an issue, if there is a problem, 
they feel like, okay, I can go to my supervisor and, and share my concerns. And so I think that's one of the, the nice things that we're seeing or a benefit of diversity, equity, inclusion is that it's, it's helping allow some of these relationships and dynamics to really come alive within organizations. So it sounds like creating a safe place for people to come forward and express maybe things they're unhappy with or what they're feeling. Judy, how can founders really make sure employees feel safe enough to come forward and air those grievances? I think the strongest thing that um, entrepreneurs can do with their employees is, is listening and making space for that and doing the checking in and also being proactive about it. I think always trying to understand an individual's purpose and what really matters to them, not so much what matters to the business or how quickly you can complete a task is really important. And the only way that you're ever going to find that out is by building relationships. And, and I love what Rhonda says, because I completely believe this. When you're, a small, or in, when you're in a small business environment, you have the ability to be close. You have the ability to build those relationships and and sense and get to know people. And the more that small business owners can lean into that, make the space and time, I think that's what opens up the gateway to really understanding what motivates individuals versus how can I get my employee to complete a task on time and more efficiently, et cetera. Alternatively, we're hearing stories from founders about prospective hires ghosting them in the recruiting process. If we're heading into a recession, why is that happening, Judy? And how can entrepreneurs combat that, if at all? Absolutely. So ghosting is such a funny term. I love that term. Um, there's perhaps also a bit of a misconception. So the recent August jobs report actually shows us that more folks are entering into the workplace right now. And so there's just a lot more movement happening. And that said, as we were talking about earlier, uh, competition for talent is still high. And so what you have is a lot of fluidity and that's where the ghosting starts to come in. You've got more options as a job seeker. As an employer, you're also exploring lots of other people as more candidates come into the candidate pool and ghosting is, in, is likely gonna happen. What we often tell our employers as well as our job seekers is you know, the, the hiring experience and the employee experience starts from that first impression. So everything from things like the job description that we've talked about, how your company shows up. But even before you get to that first interview, starting to think about that as an opportunity to build a relationship and to be in contact, to check in with candidates um, throughout the journey is an opportunity to prevent ghosting. So that's one thing, just kind of investing in that as uh, that interpersonal relationship. And then secondly, you know, use technology. We had indeed have built a platform where you can do everything from sourcing, screening, scheduling, interview, interviewing all in one place to take off some of that cumbersome operational stuff that I think a lot of small businesses tend to struggle with. You know, they're very busy. They've got notes over here on a post-it note. They've got a calendar and an email and a text. I mean, that is overwhelming. So thinking about ways to utilize technology as best as possible to just maybe avoid those inadvertent ghosting opportunities. Like, oh my gosh, I just forgot I had that interview. I think some of that still happens today and it's because everybody's so busy. So focus on the relationship, think about them as almost like a pre-employee and then leverage as much technology and tools as possible to just make the operational side a lot easier. Wow, think about them as a pre-employee. Rhonda, can you tell me what you see among founders when they're approaching a hire and you know treating them like a pre-employee yeah i i actually really like that i haven't heard that that term or phrase used and, and i really like that um but i i think um i think just as you would treat your existing team is taking that time out to really get to know that individual, understand what makes them tick and, and really understand what they're looking for and what a sense of belonging means to them. That's part of what um, our work it revolves around is because each employee is, is unique and what they're looking for within um, their employment is, is unique. So it's, it's really identifying um, how you can best uh, suit or meet those needs. So it becomes, um, to be used a, a trite term, is, so it becomes a win-win situation for uh, both the employer and, and the individual. 
Bernard, how would you encourage entrepreneurs to tap into that mindset of treating job seekers or applicants as pre-employees? I, I think it's a great concept. I, I too love that. I think that kind of, if that's the first entree into what this company is, you didn't lose me at hello. I'm, I'm more intrigued. I want to talk more. And I think when you can do that, you are starting a relationship because maybe they, you don't hire them in this round, but maybe you revisit them a year from now. I think you, we really should think about that in terms of this talent market is it's a relationship. It's a very small world. Uh, we might speak again. And I think if we have a positive relationship, again, that speaks to the, the intentionality of the organization, um, the values I think are being expressed. And again, you aren't losing people at hello because I think We've all probably had that poor interview experience where you go, I would never work there for that person. And it's set an impression. Um, but I think when you, uh, to Judy's point, as a pre-employee, I have a very positive impression. I'm more eager to perhaps work there. I wouldn't likely ghost you because I actually care now about this relationship that I'm forming with this organization. And so I think people should really focus on that. Like, and just treat people like human beings. I think uh, this pandemic, some people might have gone feral and forgot their way, but like treat people Humanely, be kind to them. They'll remember that. It goes a long way, and I think that speaks volumes of your company. Uh, and it, I know for me, it's an attractive aspect of working someplace where I know people are treating me with kindness, right? And that I'm respected, and, and those values are congruent with what I'm seeing on the website, the day in the life that I'm reading. It all sounds true. It's all consistent. So I think when you do that, that, that treating them like a pre-employee, I think that goes a long, long way in terms of getting uh, that trust from day one. Bernard, you mentioned change in the pandemic and so much has changed, but especially our relationship with work. And now as we face economic uncertainty, that's feeling even more present. Rhonda, is there a way entrepreneurs should approach the recruiting process differently, given that we are on the cusp of potentially some economic uncertainty? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um... Uh, something that needs to be revisited because it is an entirely different world. We're working within a different paradigm. Um, what worked, say, even five years ago may not be as effective. So with, um, with the entrepreneur, the small business owner, I think it becomes a function of really taking a look at their current practices with a, a fresh lens. And we always recommend, hey, make sure you're using a DEI lens or an equity lens to make sure that what you are offering and how you are positioning your organization is one that will be attractive to job seekers. Because again, we know that job seekers, diversity, equity, inclusion matters. And when I say diversity, sometimes people think, okay, it's black and white, but within our organization, we say it goes far beyond black and white. Um, so it's it's inclusion. It's looking at individuals, what they bring to the table, um, and and embracing that. So I think there are ways and strategies that you can a take a look at your your current practices, policies, and procedures, and modify that based on the research that we're seeing that um, these topics are incredibly important to to many of the majority of those job seekers out there. Judy, I'm curious, if small business owners are including so much in their job description, how can they also get across the things that Rhonda are saying so that if I'm a job seeker, I feel like I might be seen at this company or that I might be part of something as opposed to excluded from something? I think that's part, I mean, a job description can only do so much. I think that's one step in the journey. And I think there's plenty of opportunities along the hiring process where those values can be expressed. And so what I would encourage um, a hiring manager, an employer, is to think about those moments where you can tell those stories, share the values, and really help that potential pre-employee um, understand what, what the company's all about. So don't oh, I would say don't overly fixate on that one moment in time because there are multiple opportunities. Again, when you're thinking about building a relationship as part of the hiring process versus just screening and, and going through a series of checkboxes. I think leveraging every one of those touch points is an opportunity to express what your company is all about and the values that you want to hold. Keeps coming back to transparency. Bernard, 
what do you think about this and and how can small business owners really drive this home without while still seeming authentic? Uh, tactically, what I've done in the past is an audit. So what are people seeing? Uh, so, you know, first you can just look at the website. What are the images? What are the statements? What do people think of your organization? What's the, what are people saying on Glassdoor? What's the chatter about your company? What do people say even in terms of an internally employee surveys? Look at all that data. Then look at that. Talk to your different folks within the company. Understand what the, the tone and tenor of it is of the vibe that you're giving off. And I think once you have a good understanding of that, you've done the audit and you can see where the inconsistencies are, where, where the strengths are. I think it's almost like doing that analysis will then help you see 360 what is the perception of your organization. And I think anywhere there's places that need to be uh, bolstered, you can do that. You can then focus more on the employee value proposition or focus more on benefits. But where you find those deficiencies, doing that audit allows you to objectively look at where you can strengthen your differentiators versus others and also understand what you can't do and what you're willing to do. Right. I think by doing that audit, it greatly helps, I think, bring all those table stakes forward and understand what will help drive you forward instead. So I, I think that has always helped uh, and allows you to have a clear eyed understanding of exactly what um, the landscape is. So transparency, authenticity, these are terms we keep coming back to over and over again on really how to make your workplace seem like a welcoming place to work. Um, Judy, can you share what your number one piece of advice would be to a small business owner who's hoping to scale or hire in the next six to 12 months? I think the number one thing I would say is stick with it. I know um, all these uncertain times sometimes can feel a bit disheartening or discouraging, but I think these are really exciting times and an opportunity to add awesome people to your team and for people to, to remain authentic. Employers um, have great stories. They're so passionate about why they do what they do. Sharing that story with a potential employee or future employee will help you find that really great fit next hire. And don't fret. People want to work. People want to have a sense of purpose. And that's the kind of person you want as the next person on your team. Bernard, what would be your number one piece of advice for a small business owner? Very similar to Judy, I would say it's VIP, vision, inspire, and then purpose. Uh, the vision, I think, allows people to see beyond today, right? If I'm inspired, I want to come do it. Uh, I want to come to work. It's part of what's integral to me. And then I think the purpose, like I think people really want purpose-driven work. If your company can find those elements, I think it is incredibly attractive. Uh, so that's why I'm going with the VIP vision, inspiration, and purpose. Rhonda, what would you suggest to entrepreneurs who are hoping to scale or hire in the next six months to 12 months? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what my recommendation is to um, read the landscape. But again, there's a lot of research out there that um, shows what uh, attributes employees like or prefer about a small business over a larger organization. So really identifying, understanding um, what some of those hot buttons are and then figuring out, okay, what's my strategy so I can really lean into um, some of these opportunities that perhaps we haven't had an opportunity or that vision to lean into. And, and for me, it always comes back to um, creating that very inclusive environment because at the end of the day, we all want to feel like we, we belong. At the end of the day, we do our best work when we're within an environment where we feel supported and appreciated and our voices are heard. And I think there's several different diversity, equity, inclusion strategies that allow you to do just that. I'd like to thank my guests, Judy, Rhonda, and Bernard. Thank you for sharing such actionable insights on what small business owners and entrepreneurs can do to scale their businesses by navigating today's fast-changing talent market in order to make the right moves for their next key hire. And thank you to our presenting partner, Indeed. And to our audience, thank you for joining. Remember to share your thoughts using the hashtag InsiderEvents. We'll continue to cover these topics with Insider, so please be sure to follow us and check out our newly relaunched Talent Insider Hub. 
In a few moments, our survey will pop up on your screen. We'd love to get your feedback so we can keep improving. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day.